arrive at a conclusion different to that of the trial court. The court added, in order to succeed, therefore, the applicant must convince this court on proper grounds that it has prospects of success on appeal and that those prospects are not remote but they have a realistic chance of succeeding. Thus, my lady, in paragraph four, we respectfully emphasize that the present application for leave to appeal ought not to be construed in relation to any aspect as an insult to this honorable court judgment on sentence. Contrary, my lady, to what has been submitted by a respondent in his written opposition to the state's application. It's respectfully submitted that the application for leave to appeal ought merely, my lady, to be viewed as a valid application where the state respectfully seeks leave to appeal against an appealable order, a sentence. My lady, I will deal with the essence of our argument and then we've highlighted certain misdirections that we think we want to highlight today. As far as the essence of our argument is concerned, my lady, we respectfully argue that the sentence of six years imprisonment on the murder conviction is so shockingly and inappropriately lenient and is founded on a number of material misdirections. My lady, in paragraph 2.5, we respectfully submit that although we have enumerated several misdirections in our application, we will, for purpose of the argument today, highlight only a few. Then paragraph 2.2, we respectfully submit that there are reasonable prospects that a court of appeal may arrive at a different conclusion on sentence, and my lady find that the sentence passed is startlingly or strikingly disparate from the sentence which the court of appeal may consider appropriate for the crime, the offender, the needs for of society and the interest of the victim of the, or the victim's family. Lady, we will come back to paragraph 2.3 on quite a few occasions. It's respectfully submitted, my lady, that the sentence imposed reflects an overemphasis of the personal circumstances of the offender and is not in proportion to the objective gravity of the crime, the interest of society and the interest of the victim and the victim's family. It's accordingly respectfully submitted that there are reasonable prospects that the Court of Appeal may interfere with and increase the sentence on appeal. My lady, in paragraph 2.6, we argue that the test is, if it can be shown that the material misdirection in the imposing of sentence may reasonably be found to exist by a Court of Appeal, the, this Court should grant leave. My lady, in paragraph 2.7, we argue, it's respectfully submitted that this fact is so given that it's a trite principle that the sentence may be vitiated by material misdirection. We refer to the Director of Public Prosecutions, Kuzulu Natal versus P, where the SCA held, my lady, and that's important, the test for interference by an appeal court is whether the sentence imposed by the trial court is vitiated by irregularity one, or misdirection two, or three, my lady, is disturbingly inappropriate. We also, my lady, in the same paragraph, refer to S versus Bogarts, where the Constitutional Court confirms that while sentencing falls within the discretion of the trial court, an appellate court may interfere with a sentence where there's been an irregularity, my lady, that results in a failure of justice, two, the court below misdirected itself to such an extent that a decision on sentence is vitiated, or three malady sentences so disproportionate or shocking that no reasonable court could have imposed it. Malady, this principle is so well established, it goes as far back, and we refer to the, in paragraph 2.8 as the well known decision of S. Versus Spiller, uh, that if there's a misdirection, the Court of Appeal may interfere. My lady, may I then refer to paragraph 2.9. And my lady, with the utmost respect, I cannot emphasize this enough. We respectfully submit that it's not incumbent on the applicant to convince this court that this court in fact misdirected itself on sentence. But my lady, merely that another court may reasonably find that this court materially misdirected itself, which would warrant the Court of Appeal to interfere, my lady. My lady, whilst it's 
easy with respect. And, and I've done so on many occasions, my lady, to argue in opposing an application for leave to appeal against sentence, that the sentence is comprehensive and balanced. And my lady, whilst at, at the time of sentencing, this court have regarded the sentence as appropriate. And my lady, whilst the court may still regard the sentence as appropriate today, an objective reappraisal of the sentence by a court of appeal may reasonably lead to the conclusion that material misdirections were occasioned by this court which vitiate the sentence and indeed, my lady, that the sentence imposed is shockingly inappropriate. These two paragraphs, my lady, I, I say with the utmost respect, is, is very important. That we don't have to convince the court, we just have to show that the court of appeal may reasonably find that this court misdirected itself or that the sentence is shockingly inappropriate. And that would be our approach arguing further as far as this application is concerned. But lady, in 2.11, we respectfully submit that we refer to a number of legal principles in, in our application. We argue that a number of legal principles have crystallized over time, which a court should consider in sentencing an accused. We refer to extensive case law in our argument before sentence, and further in our notice of appeal, my lady, which articulates, articulates this well-settled principles on sentence. We have referred to the principles, my lady, enunciated in these cases, which are pertinent to the question of proper exercising of the court sentencing discretion. These principles, my lady, with the utmost respect, are binding on this court and ought to shape the exercising of the dis sentence discretion. My lady, a failure to adhere to such principles in the passing of sentence may constitute a misdirection and consequently, my lady, warrant interference with the sentence on appeal. We do not, my lady, with respect, refer to inapposite extracts taken out of context. We argue, my lady, that respondent's written argument, therefore, on this particular aspect is interesting. The reference, my lady, is to principles in the case law, and we say with the utmost respect that this court is bound by the principles enunciated in, in these cases. My lady, in paragraph 2.2 we say, after all, an essential inquiry, inquiry with respect in an appeal against sentence is whether the sentencing court, in imposing it, exercised its discretion properly and judicially. The exercise of a judicial discretion on sentence requires the court to give a balanced evaluation of the gravity of the defense, the interests of the offender, the interests of society, and the requirements of good administration of justice. My lady, we, we say that a sentencing discretion is judicially exercised when the sentence passed, my lady, is free of any irregularity or misdirection and is proportionate to the crime criminal, the interest of society, and the interest of the victim, and my lady, which does not induce a sense of shock. My lady, as indicated earlier, we will refer to six misdirections that we respectfully would argue that was occasioned by the court in sentence. Firstly, my lady, paragraph 3.1. Whereas the court found that murder is always a very serious crime and that the fact that the accused thought that the deceased was an intruder does not make the crime less serious. My lady, that can be found at page 4, 4164 and 4165 of the judgment. At 4164, at line 20, this court found murder is always a very serious crime. The fact that the accused thought that it was intruder does not make it less serious. That it was intruder does not make it less serious. That's at 4164. At 4165, at lines 18, notwithstanding the above circumstances, it's worth repeating that the murder is a serious offense in the present case, a deadly weapon in the form of a firearm was used and resulted were devastating. 
The fact that the murder took place under circumstances as described above does not in any way make the offence any less serious. My lady, but then, and we say it with the utmost respect, at 4172, the court misdirected itself in holding that the respondents believe that the intruder had entered the house was a mitigating factor, whereas the court indicating that it does not make the crime any less serious. Especially, my lady, when it got us out to the objective gravity of the crime and the fact that this court and the SEA rejected respondent's version that, that he acted in the private defense. My lady, may I pause to refer the court to paragraph 4172 of the judgment of this court, where this court dealt with the mitigating factors. My lady, I've numbered four, with the utmost respect. The accused approached the bathroom in the belief that the intruder had entered the house. That's number one. There's no indication that there was a threat or a perceived threat in, in, in the court's judgment. Secondly, it is sufficient. the accused immediately took steps to try and save the deceased life. Number three. He was distraught and kept on asking God to save the deceased life and promising to serve him in return. Number four, my lady. He reiterated that the cue showed that that was my argument. The, the court will then also found remorse by the accused. My lady, we'll get back to this, but if I, whilst I'm pausing, the mere fact, my lady, and, and if regard is had to page 4172, the accused thought there was an intruder and fired. Not that there was any threat to him. Not in terms of judgment and not in terms of what was found in the SCA. My lady, may I then refer to paragraph 3.2? We say that the court misdirected itself in underemphasizing the trite principle enunciated in Malchas and my lady all the judgment that followed on Malchas Rosli, Michichi, Nkunkuma and Brown those are the, the major decisions my lady that when sentencing in terms of the minimum sentence legislation it was no longer to be business as usual and indeed the emphasis was to be shifted to the objective gravity of this type of crime and the public's need for effective sanction against it But lady, may I have just been reminded where we refer to paragraph 2.4 and paragraph 2.2.1 .2 and 2. Point, that's a cross reference, my lady, to our application. We will not read our application, but all the paragraphs in, in our heads, my lady, those are cross reference to our application. 3.3, and we say that secondly, my lady, the, the, the second argument as far as misdirection is concerned. This court, my lady, with utmost respect, misdirected itself in finding that the aggravating factors in Castle are outweighed by the mitigating factors. We deal with the aggravating factors and mitigating factors identified by this court in our application. We, we respectfully submit, my lady, that the court failed to take into account three major factors. Now, these three major factors, my lady, by not taking them into account, underemphasizing their value amounts to a misdirection and will have a material impact on segments. First, my lady, it was in the bedroom that the respondent had formed the intention to shoot and when he realized that there was somebody behind the toilet door, he fired four shots. Lady, that particular aspect is a material aggravating factor that not only when the accused arrived in the bathroom that he formed the intention to shoot. He formed that intention in the bedroom, walking to the bathroom. When he realized there was somebody, he fired. That must be an aggravating factor, and that factor has not been taken into account with that, Mr. Speaker. There was no finding that he was threatened or that he, there was, that he could have perceived 
that there was a threat. A lady, we say in point number two, the Supreme Court of Appeal as well as this court rejected the defense that the respondent acted in private defense or even putative private defense. Thus, my lady, and that is perhaps the issue that should be stressed, there existed no justification for the respondent's actions. And perhaps, my lady, the most important factor that the court failed to take into account is that the respondent fired four shots through the door and he never offered an acceptable explanation for having done so. We say with the utmost respect, my lady, although the court gave effect to the fact that the judgment and the conviction was changed from culpable homicide to murder by the, by the SCA, we argue with respect that the court take, failed to take into account the inferences and findings made by the SCA. Those the court should take into account. My lady, may I refer the court there to the, the finding of the SCA, where at paragraph 36, my lady, the, the SCA explained as a matter of law that it could draw different factual inferences from the primary facts found proved by this trial court. So the inferences drawn from the primary facts, my lady, those are binding on this court. And, and we say without disrespect, it did not get the necessary attention and emphasis in the sentence, in the judgment of the sentence. We then, my lady, we say at paragraph 3.4, to respectfully submitted that had the court properly weighed these aggravating factors, together with the objective gravity of the crime of murder, the interest of society and the interest of the victim and the victim's family, the court could not reasonably and judicially reach the conclusion that the mitigating factors outweigh the aggravating factors. But it's, with, with respect even more so, when, when, with respect, the trite principle is borne in mind that, as enunciated in S. versus Velikazi, in cases of serious crime, the personal circumstances of the offender by themselves will necessarily recede, necessarily recede into the background. And to elevate the personal circumstances of the accused above that of society in general, and the victim or the victim's family in particular, would not serve the well-established aims of sentencing, including deterrence and retribution. We refer to the Court of Appeal matter, Hewitt versus the State. <coughs> it's not been reported yet, my lady. May I hand up a copy of this particular judgment? Mm -hmm. where it was found that scrupulous care must be taken not to overemphasize the accused's personal circumstances without balancing those considerations properly against the very serious nature of the crimes committed, the aggravating circumstances and the consequences for the victims and the interests of society. And we add here, and the victim's family. Thirdly, my lady, we argue that the court misdirected itself in finding that the accused is a good candidate for rehabilitation and then what's important is the following my lady and that the other purposes of punishment although important ought not to play a dominant role in the sentencing process that was the finding of this court whereas my lady the the trite principle is serious crime will usually require that retribution and deterrence should come to the fore and that the rehabilitation of the offender will consequently play a relatively smaller role. You say with the utmost respect, my lady, that, and it's an argument in this application, that that's a misdirection in terms of the well-established principles on sentencing, my lady. We say, my lady, with the utmost respect, as we said in paragraph 2.3, that this particular aspect was elevated to an overarching factor which is against the principles. We say in paragraph 3.8, my lady, it's respectfully submitted that the court could not reasonably and judicially find that the respondent is ripe for rehabilitation when it's considered that 
seeds of rehabilitation can, in a manner of speaking, germinate only if the convicted person himself has first and foremost express, expressed contrition for his criminal wrongdoing, thereby accepting the gravity of the criminal act of which he and she has been convicted. My lady, the, def the defense called Professor Dr. Scott to uh, try and, and explain that the accused accepted his conviction and change of conviction. But, my lady, we say that the court correctly rejected the version of the accused about the suicide in prison. But we argue, that although the court rejected that version, perhaps the court did not give enough effect to the inference that th this was just another lying version by the accused that we got used to, and probably, my lady, an attempted manipulation of the process by trying to portray what he experienced in prison, my lady. My lady, he never testified. The fact that he accepts the gravity of the criminal act that, the, of which he has been convicted has not been tested, my lady. We respectfully argue, my lady, that the court misdirected itself in finding that the respondent is genuinely remorseful, where the Supreme Court of Appeal made it clear made it patently and repeatedly clear that one really does not know what his exp explanation is for having fired the fatal shot. The ACI said that, my lady. This court, with the utmost respect, should give effect to what the, the finding of the ACI. But, my lady, it goes one step further. During the cross-examination of Professor Scholes, it was put to him, that this accused elected to give a version to the world, but he never testified in this court. But in my eyes then say, where the court re correctly rejected Professor Scholes' evidence that the accused's condition is not, not, not such that he should be hospitalized. By inference, my lady, the court also rejected, or at least should have rejected the version that is, his condition is so severe that he's not able to testify. The court made credibility findings about scores. The court rejected his version on the suicide, although that comes from the, from the accused. As far as the uh, condition is concerned that he should be hospitalized, that was also rejected. Milady, therefore by inference, the court should have rejected the fact that the accused was in no condition to testify. My lady, in paragraph 3 point, three point 10, it's respectfully submitted, my lady, that the court misdirected itself in failing to take into consideration that there's a distinction between, on the one hand, responding having exhibited some regret for his actions after the killing and seeking forgiveness from the deceased family for the mistake of having killed his girlfriend and genuine remorse. There's a distinct uh, difference between it. On the other hand, which the respondent does not have, in that he still has not given a satisfactory reason for having fired the fatal shot, that is to say, he has still not sufficiently indicated what motivated him to commit the murder. We say with utmost respect, my lady, the court failed with respect to take into account or give adequate, adequate consideration to the well-established fact that there's a chasm between regret and remorse. Many accused persons might well regret their conduct, but that does not without more translate to genuine remorse. But I can do no better than to refer the court to the very well-known decision of Machichi as far as remorse is concerned. May I just read uh, one specific quote from Machichi? I'm reading a summary of the Machichi judgment that can be f found in S versus Nkunkuma, my lady. In S versus Nkunkuma, there's reference to Machichi at, parag at paragraph 14. And it says, in order for the rem remorse to be a valid consideration, the penitence must be sincere and the accused must take the court fully into his or her confidence. 
until and unless that happens, the genuineness of the contrition alleged to, alleged to exist cannot be determined. Lady, and what we saying, and, and we'll, we'll get back to this. With the judgment of the SCA known to the where the SCA said on more than one occasion that the reason for the firing of the shots are not known, we really just don't know. Well knowing that that exists, that the SCA said, we don't know why he fired the shots. The accused elected not to testify. His remorse and or prospects of rehabilitation could not be tested. But that we continue, my lady, paragraph 3.11, we say that the court, with the utmost respect, misdirected itself and underemphasizing the principles expressed by Boschiello J. Hay, in the Director of Public Prosecutions, North Gauteng versus Tabete, namely, my lady, it strikes that one of the essential ingredients of a balanced sentence is that it must reflect the seriousness of the offence and the natural indignation and outrage of the public. Fourthly, my lady, the court with respect misdirected itself in underemphasizing the trite principle that when sentencing in terms of the minimum sentence legislation, a court is not given a clean slate on which to inscribe whatever sentence it thinks fit or appropriate. But the starting point in a matter such as this, my lady, is the prescribed minimum sentence ordained by the legislature. My lady, we then say, with respect, that the court failed to appreciate that the starting point in the present matter was a sentence of 15 years imprisonment. To have reduced the sentence from 15 years to six years for murder, notwithstanding the mitigating factors of personal circumstances of the respondent, it induces a sense of shock. A fortiori where the court did not stipulate what the substantial and compelling circumstances were, which seemingly the court regarded as justifying the imposition of a lesser sentence. Lady, by inference, page 4172 is an indication of the substan substantial and compelling factors that this court took into account. Those are formal, lady. With the utmost respect, we say that taking into account all the mitigating factors in the judgment, that it is shocking to think that a sentence of six years from the starting point of 15 years is appropriate. We say that the court with utmost respect viewed sentence as starting from a clean slate where the court should not have, the court should have started at 15 years. It goes even further, my lady. Uh, my lady, this spe specific, specific principle that the starting point in a matter such as this is a prescribed minimum sentence ordained by the legislature. That specific point, my lady, has been followed by Malchas, Machichi, Nkukuma, and Brown. It's a well known trite principle that should be followed, my lady. Failure to do, my lady, we say with the utmost respect amounts to misdirection or, or that the SCA may view this reasonably as a misdirection. Right, the court with respect misdirection, uh, we had 3.13, misdirected itself and underemphasizing the trite principle that when sentencing in terms of the minimum sentence legislation, the court must assess whether in all the circumstances the sentence is proportionate to the crime committed and uh, whether the sentence is just one. While each case must be assessed on its own merit, the court found that. We respectfully submit that the court nevertheless misdirected itself in under-emphasizing under the trial principle that when imposing sentence in terms of minimum sentence legislation, a severe, standardized, and consistent response from the courts is required. By due regard to the sentence that ought ordinarily to be imposed for the commission of the listed crimes. My lady, we referred in 3.15 to Malchas, where in Malchas, even if the court find that there are compelling and substantial circumstances, account must be taken of the fact that the crime of, of that particular kind 
has been singled out for severe punishment and that the sentence to be imposed in lieu of the prescribed sentence should be assessed paying due regard to the benchmark which the legislature has provided. 15 years, my lady. That's the benchmark. There's no clean slate, my lady. It starts there. Compelling and substantial circumstances should be and could be taken into account, but with reference, my lady, of the starting point and not of a clean slate. We say, my lady, in paragraph 3.16, the court with respect materially misdirected itself and underemphasizing the tribe principle that even where the substantial and compelling circumstances are found to exist which justify the imposition of a lesser sentence than the minimum prescribed sentence, the sentences prescribed create a legislative standard that weighs upon the exercise of the sentence in court's discretion. This entails sentences for the scheduled crimes that are consistently heavier than before. That is, that is Abrams, Matthew, my lady, and a factor that's, that's been ele elevated to a principle as far as sentence concerned. Mm. A principle in considering mm. sentence where minimum legislation is involved, my lady, and the court should follow those principles. My lady, at 3.17, we say, the court materially mis misdirected itself with respect to finding that long-term imprisonment would not serve the justice in this case. Also having regard to the following factors, my lady, having regard to the factors which was found by the Supreme Court of Appeal, which are based on the court's finding of fact, and that can only be this, my lady, that the respondent fired four shots at the toilet door because he thought there was an intruder in the toilet. May I pause, my lady, by saying to view that fact as a substantial and mitigating factor would indicate, my lady, that taking into account the judgment of the court, and I say with the utmost respect, that the life of an intruder behind the closed door where he cannot escape is not worth that. My lady, even if he thought this was an intruder, there was just no threat. He walked to the bathroom and fired four shots. That is the finding, my lady. The finding is, at, he decided in the bedroom to f shoot at whoever, if there was somebody in the bathroom. Whoever, whoever. That was the finding, my lady. Whoever was in the bathroom. When he realized there was, he fired. There's nothing else, my lady. The vulnerability will get to. But that is the fact of his intention. Was formed to shoot whoever. And we cannot, with my lady, with the utmost respect, argue that even if he thought there was an intruder behind a closed door in a small cubicle, that that's a mitigating factor because the life of an intruder is not that important. But that can never be the court's finding with the utmost respect, my lady, and amounts to a misdirection. We say, my lady, there was no indication of a real or imminent or immediate threat at all. Because this vision was rejected. The, the, the Court of Appeal said, we just don't know. We respectfully submit that our courts are enjoined to severely punish a case person who shoot and kill without reason. Respondent exhibited some regret when it turned out to be the deceased, but has as yet not given a credible explanation of why he fired the shot. Lady, in a, in a matter by the Deputy Judge President of this division, S. versus Martin. The court put it very succinctly, my lady. When the court said, S. versus Martin, the decision of this division at 176J, to determine sentence particularly for a more serious crime, there's not a more important question than. This was 1996, my lady. Why did you do it? It's hardly excusable to ask a case how many children he has and to admit the crucial why did you do it. With no known or answer to that question, the accused is at risk, appearing to have acted without reason and to deserve the harshness which accompanies wanton criminality which is executed without anything which reduces moral reprehensibility. Now, it is a judgment by one 
judge in this court in a trial, but it, it sets it out what we try and portray in Malay, and what the SCA said in Malay, what the, by saying, we don't know. Now, by don't know, the only person that can tell us why, and give us a credible explanation, is the accused. At the, at the moment, Malay, the finding is, he formed his intention, he walked to the bathroom, he saw there was somebody, he realized there was somebody, he fired the shots. Malay, fifthly, and, and perhaps, my lady, the most material misdirection is in not where the court failed to grade the degree of Dolis of Charles. We respectfully submit, my lady, that this court misinterpreted Sup Supreme Court's finding, findings as to the, the degree of uh, foreseeability. We say, my lady, that and respectfully argue that the court was bound by the inferences drawn by the Supreme Court of Appeal based on the factual findings of this court. The court is bound by it, my lady. That we say that the court materially misdirected itself in finding that there's no suggestion in the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal that the Dolis of Incharles or Respondent boarded on Dolis direction, directors, whereas the Supreme Court of Appeal held and will We'll then refer to that. My lady, may I? My argument saying that the appeal court, the SCA never said it borders on it. But the, the SCA indicated what the degree of foreseeability is. My lady, in, in, in the first sentence, the court took into account a degree of negligence. My lady, it's exactly the same with the utmost respect as far as Dolis of Incharles is concerned. Dolis of Incharles could be uh, fore foreseeability as a remote possibility. That's uh, on the one end of the scale. And on the other end of the scale, my lady, we say, as was found by the SCA, as a matter of common sense, at the time of the fatal shots were fired, the possibility of the death of the person behind the door was clearly an obvious result. Remote possibility to obvious result. Lady, they cannot, I say this with the utmost respect, but there cannot be a degree past obvious. Because if there's a degree past obvious, that must be Dolis Directors. The next step of the obvious, my lady, must be Dolis Directors. Which means, my lady, that this is very close to Dolis Directors. We're not, we've never ar argued Dolis Directors, and we don't do it now. But what we argue is that if the result is obvious, then it's very close to it. But it goes further, my lady. And in firing not one, but four shots, it became even more likely. Likely and obvious, my lady, is a degree within Dodis Directors. Ach, Dodis Eventuals, I apologize. The We've highlighted the last sentence. In the light of the nature of the firearm and the ammunition used and the extremely limited space into which it's sort of fired, the dividends is understandable, the reference to when counsel argued. Ready? So our argument is that it was a misdirection by the court to make a finding that there was no suggestion in the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal that those of Charles of the respondent ordered on those directors. We say it's clear that the only inference is that that is what's meant by the, the portion that we quoted to him. We submit with respect that the, court material mis, mis, the court's material misdirection in not grading the respondents' dollars of each other as bordering on those directors is also borne out by the following facts accepted by the Supreme Court of Appeal. And we quote, my lady, the deceased must have been standing behind the door when she was first shot and then collapsed behind the to toilet bowl. Although the precise dimensions of the toilet cubicle do not appear from the record, it is clear from the photograph that it's extremely small. And it's also apparent that all the, sh apparent that all the shots fired through the door would almost inevitably have struck the person behind it. There had effectively been nowhere for the deceased to hide. Lady, if you fire through a door, knowing that there's nowhere to hide, 
uh, and even if that's an objective fact, that is very close to Doris Directus. My lady, we also refer to the, where the SCA discuss, dis, discussed Captain Magena's evidence. My lady, we argue that Captain Magena's evidence was taken into account at the reconstruction of the scene, was taken into account by the SCA. But it was given no weight, my lady, with the utmost respect by this court in the evaluation of sentence. My lady, we also, may I pause? We, we, we've referred to the family, we've referred to the accused as a fallen hero in the judgment. But my lady, we, with the utmost respect, this court did not give effect to the horrendous death that this uh, deceased suffered. But I think that is something that should be taken into account with sentence. In a small cubicle, while well, one after those shot is fired through a door, it's just a horrendous way of dying. And my lady, not the misperception or the fight is the issue that, that bothered Mr. Stienkamp. This issue, what happened to her? What did she experience when the shots were... That is what bothers Mr. Steer Company's evidence. With utmost respect, my lady, it, didn't, it was underemphasized in the judgment of this court. My lady, at 320.2, Captain Mungene testified that the black talent ammunition the accused had used was specifically designed for the purpose of self-defense. It would penetrate the wooden door without disintegrating, but would mushroom on striking a soft, moist target such as human flesh causing devastating wounds to any person who might be hit. The veracity of this is borne out by the photographs depicting the injuries that he sustained correctly described by the trial court as being horrendous. My lady, that fact that black talent ammunition was used is an aggravating factor that should be laid, that it should be blamed on the accused. Well knowing what kind of ammunition he used, he still used it. We say with utmost respect that that did not get the, the attention of the sport in sentence than it should have. The scene and the ammunition used and what happened to the deceased while she was in that uh, toilet cubicle, those are all very aggravating factors. And if that is weighed against an accused who apologized after the event and wanted to, was regretful on the night that it happened, prayed to God, that would then fade into insignificance. Because the seriousness of the crime should come to the fore in crimes like this. 3.20.3, milady. I'm not reading the whole paragraph, the last sentence. He paused at the entrance to the bathroom. When he became aware that there was a person in the toilet, he fired four shots through the door, and he never offered an acceptable explanation for having done so. Really, we are mindful of the fact that we don't have to convince this court that this court erred. And, and that's not what we're trying to do, my lady. But what we're saying is that was known to the accused when this court resentenced that particular paragraph saying, and he never offered an acceptable explanation for having answer. Well, knowing that that's a finding that this court will take into account, he elected not to testify. Elected to call Professor Scholes, and Professor Scholes wasn't a good witness. We say, my lady, that in paragraph 3.21, we respectfully argue that the proper grading of a respondent's culpability would lead to a much heavier sentence. And thus, there are reasonable prospects that on, a, on this basis alone, a court of appeal will interfere with the sentence. My lady, the, when we started with the misdirections, 
And at paragraph 3.1, where we said that murder is always a serious crime, even even if the deceased thought that it was an intruder, and that was later used as a mitigating factor. That, my lady, linked with this, and I say it with the utmost respect, failure to grade the notice of Charles would, my lady, allow a court of appeal to reasonably, after reasonable consideration of all the facts, to interfere with the sentence. As far as the six grouping is concerned, my lady, at 3.22, we say that the court erred in regarding the vulnerability of the accused as a mitigating factor. So the court did not err, uh, over exaggerated that. We, we respectfully deal with this aspect in our notice of appeal, paragraphs 2.10.1 to 2.10.5. Uh, I've got the wrong, but, but the head you, you have, it, it's a correct reference. We respectfully argue that both the court and the Supreme Court of Appeal pointed out that despite the respondent's disability and vulnerability, he was able to overcome such in, and excel in life, particularly in relation to his major athletic achievements worldwide. But Marie, what is perhaps more important is the next sentence. More importantly, with respect, the court material misdirected itself in overlooking or underemphasizing the pre court of appeals finding and that's a finding my lady that this court was bound by that respondent's subjective intention was unaffected by the accused physical disabilities the fact that he had not been wearing his prosthesis at the time and that he had been thus been particularly vulnerable to any aggression directed at him by an intruder the court of appeal made a finding my lady that, that his subjective intention was unaffected by that. We quote the appeal court again. May we add, my lady, that the court refers to the physical demonstration by the accused in court. But, my lady, the physical demonstration of the accused at the night would have looked something different. It would have been an accused walking down a passage armed with a lethal fire ready to shoot. My lady, that's not vulnerable. That is... If somebody's armed with a firearm, a lethal firearm, loaded with ammunition that would devastate, such a person is formidable, not vulnerable. That is the person, not the person that walked in court, my lady, but the person that night that walked down the passage, shouted at the intruder. When he saw him, he fired the shots. That is the... the person that this court should take into account. My lady, I have to switch. We deal with the misperceptions at paragraph 3.2.3. We respectfully argue that the courts, the, this court, with respect, my lady, misdirected itself in, in regarding the misperception in the public that the argument between the respondent and the deceased preceded the killing as a factor that could not be ignored in determining an appropriate sentence. It was never, with respect, our, our contention on sentence that there was an argument before the murder was committed. We never argued it, at, at this court should never have taken that into account. The public's misperceptions, my lady, was, was with utmost respect, entirely irrelevant to a matter of sentence. As an open to comment, perhaps not, lady, but to be taken into account a misperception by society about a sin, uh, uh, about the conviction is not an aspect that should be taken into account. We say, with the utmost respect, it's irrelevant. What was relevant, however, as far as society is concerned, is that society had an interest that the respondent be appropriately sentenced on a very serious crime perpetrated against an innocent, defenseless woman who had nowhere to hide when the shots were fired, particularly when no acceptable reason was proffered by the accused to, to this court for having fired the fatal shot. Society had an interest, my lady, in the sentence being imposed that adequately reflect 
It's this quiet experience in relation to the nature and gravity of the crime committed, which this quiet melody is expressed in the minimum sentence legislation. Is it is this public interest that the court had to give sufficient weight to in passing sentence? As this court with respect correctly pointed out before proceeding to focus on an emphasis, at first the court said, the interest society demand that people who commit serious crimes such as murder must be punished severely. The court said, this court will not be swayed by public misperceptions. But the court then took this into account and said it's an important factor that should be taken into account. And we say without much respect, a court of appeal may find that that amounted to a misdirection and that the court, would, the court of appeal would have a right to interfere with sentence. Conclusion, my lady, we respectfully submit that the reasonable prospect that a court of appeal may find that the misdirections dealt with in our application were occasioned by this court, which misdirections are material and with us vitiate the sentence imposed. Further respectfully submitted that a reasonable prospect that a court of appeal may find that the sentence passed is shockingly and inappropriate, lenient, and strikingly disparate from a sentence which a court of appeal may consider appropriate for the crime, the criminal, and its society. We accordingly sub respectfully submit, my lady, that the test has been satisfied for the granting of leave to appeal against the sentence in this matter, and all does to be so ordered. My lady, in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act, in the way I read it, the state only has a right to appeal to the SCA and not to a full judge. Section 316B makes that clear, my lady, that we don't have a right to appeal to a full bench. We only have a right to appeal to the SCA. And therefore, my lady, we respectfully submit. We, it's 316B1 is clear, my lady. Subject to subsection 2, the Attorney General may appeal to the appeal division against sentence imposed upon an accused in a criminal case in the Superior Court. Therefore, my lady, we apply for leave to appeal to approach the SCA as a good business.